Yeah. Let me try Facebook one more time. Mm -hmm. Oh no, we got to do something different. Okay. We start with my little favorite song. I'll say good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's another day to be in the house of the God and in the land of the living. This little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. And I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, and I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, and I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, and I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine all in my home, and I'm going to let it shine all in my home, and I'm going to let it shine all in my home, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Well, good morning, Mr. Bourne. You made it. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Good morning. You all ready with your scriptures? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You and your computer not working too well this morning? No, uh, no, it wasn't that. It was the baby. She's been sick for the last two or three days. Okay, well, we're on live. I'm glad she is. She doing better? Yeah, a little bit. I think so. Okay. Psalm 16, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You want me to read it right now? Right now? We started. Okay. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, next, we have a reading of the Word of God coming out of Psalms, chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. Uh, victim of David, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust, O my soul. Thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Their sorrow shall be multiplied, that hastens after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who have given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night sessions, seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of the life, and thy presence is fullness of joy at the right hand. There are pledges forevermore. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. 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 Shall we pray? This morning, our Heavenly Father, it's once again that a few of your humble, dedicated, faithful servants have assembled ourselves out to the house of prayer. We come before your throne of grace to say, Lord, we thank you, we worship, and we praise you 
and we adore you for waking us up this morning and giving us a mind and the ability to assemble out in the house of worship. And for that, we thank you. Father, we just thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay. We have another powerful lesson uh, coming out of the first chapter of Ephesians 1 and verses 15 through 26. And the topic of our lesson is Christ is Wisdom. And let me speak to the folks over there in Africa. Get your books, your Bibles, and open them up to Ephesians, the first chapter in Ephesians. And we'll be talking from verses 15 through 26. Okay? All right. And our subtopic of the day's lesson is wisdom as an enlightenment of the heart. And that's a powerful. And as I was sitting up here reading and meditating, once we get Christ in our heart, there is, is much enlightenment. There is a peace, sense of joy, a sense of peace that we can't get anywhere else. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me start here. Then. So we are continuing our lesson. I look at Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus or the Ephesian Christians. And he today he's talking to them about um, prayer, the enlightenment, and the power of prayer, and that we as believers has power when we can come together and unity and pray, and even when we are individually and praying with faith and sincerity in our prayer. God hears and God answers. So my aim is, is and they align with Paul's, to show that, number one, there's power in prayer. And uh, just as he was trying to deepen the Ephesian Christians of and the understanding of God's overall purpose for them and us as Christ's body. And they've come together and pray in unity and serve his will, do his will. Then uh, we have unmeasurable gifts in our intercessory prayer. That is making petitions to God for someone else other than ourselves. Okay. Now, then the purpose of it and offering an intercessory prayer is uh, showing our demonstration of love for someone else whom we care about or in need of prayer, whether it's the church coming together or individually uh, pray. Now, you know, in James 5 and 16, it says what? The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And the verse before that, prior to that, uh, 15 says, Now, if there's some sick among you, call the deacons and the elders to come and pray for you. So what that is, those verses are saying to us, there's power in prayer. And if there's some sick among you, call on the church. Now, we can we can look at that in, di in a different way. If you call the preacher, or if you can call that prayer warriors in your church, in the church or individually, who suddenly will go to God in prayer and be effective in their prayers. Okay, all right. So my first question is this, and maybe I need to get my Bible here, is, is there power in prayer? Mm -hmm. Now, I just said that there is, and we can look no further than the book of Acts, Let's go here to Acts, 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 Acts. The book of Acts and chapter 1 and verse 13. I, I hope you get, you don't walk with me through the Bible because I might run around through it because I'm making my point. <laughs> and I always remember the late Pastor Smith when he said, I'm just trying to make a point here. I'm trying to solidify the point that there is power in prayer and Acts. 1 and verse 13 and 14, and I'm going to read it. 
It said, and when they were come in, they went up to the upper room where abode both Peter and John and James and Andrew, Phillips and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Aphrodite and Simon Zelula and Judah, the brother of James. And they did what? Here's 14. He said, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. It's saying, tell us this. Now, let me go to verse 20. This is verifying my fact of my statement, and I'm not pulling it out of the air, that there is power in prayer. Now, you're going to hear me say that once more. And verse 4, 24 of Acts 1. And they prayed and said, Thus, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether it is these two that thou hast chosen. They was praying for some, uh, um, when they always was praying, when they get, when they're coming together to make a selection, they went in and they had prayer. And, and I'll say this, in our modern day, and I'm going to get to verse two and one to talk about prayer, to what I was talking about, there's power in prayer. And they, the old church, and even when you look at what I'm reading from, the book of Acts, that there is power in prayer. That was the answer to my question. And verse uh, chapter Acts 2 and 1 says this, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, praying. And now we know what happened on the day of Pentecost, okay? God, the Holy Spirit came and there was a spiritual awakening of the phenomenon that had never happened before. You know, God manifested himself in three different ways on the day of Pentecost in voice and visual and in sound, <clears throat> the manifestation. And it is said that was the very beginning of God harvesting soul. So, yes, there is power in prayer. Let nobody tell you otherwise. Now, if we go to Second Chronicles 7, 14, it tells us when what happened when the church come together. Because it said, if my people, who are the people? A lot of people think it's about the folks in the world, but the people, uh, God's people is the one who's called by his name. If my people who are called by my name will do what? Humble themselves, pray, and seek my faith. God promised to do two things. He do, do this. He said, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal their land. And I know if anybody been in my classes and any many, any other, any time, they've heard me say this. We need a spiritual revival. The church needs to come together. And I'm talking about all believers, not one church by itself. And pray. And really pray, because we are doing what the scripture asks us, because seven, Second Chronicles 7, 14 is an answer, is God's answer to King Solomon when he built, they had completed the temple, and, and Solomon was praying to them and asking, asking God to take, not just take his hands off them people, and that was God's answer. He said, if my people who were called by my name will humble themselves, Pray and seek my faith, then I will. I will hear, forgive, and heal. That's the answer to the question. Is there power in prayer? There is. Mm -hmm. So my other question is this. If there's power in prayer, why is it so hard for Christians today to come together and pray? Now that's the question I, I I won't I'll say this. If we could really come together, we'll have a spiritual reawakening. But we want to come and dip. we don't get on the same accord when we come together. Let me use this example. If we come together, say you're getting ready to call a pastor. The church come together and pray. And we're, um, one, we are probably praying for just this thing. 
for our Lord to show us the pastor that he wants for this church. It will happen. It will happen. Now, let me use this. In our political side, we have people praying, and, it, and it, I'm just trying to show the differences and answer the question, why can't we as Christians come together and be on one accord and pray? And I've heard this several times. And they said, well, I'm going to pray for Trump. And I have to say to myself, I ain't praying for him. I, <laughs> because I don't like the things that he does and what he stands for. Only if I do, it will be God to change his heart. God who will change hearts. That's the, my point to that point, what I said. If we, if we, we Christians today can't come together on a unified thing, because one want to go this way, we want to go that way, we come together. We see what happened on the day of Pentecost when those disciples and others was up in that room praying mm -hmm. on one accord. God manifested himself in three ways, okay? Now, let me say this. Prayer is our most effective weapon, and we must use it in faith and honesty and believing in our prayers and lining our wills with the will of God because his will is going to be done. That's why I said lining our wills. And not just for me saying it, but that is written, line, let that will be done. That's in part of the model prayer that Jesus prayed when he told, told his disciples how to pray. And I'll say this, the church prayer is the church's most, is the greatest spiritual weapon that we have at our disposal. And I'll go back and say this. It just, and I keep showing you the day of Pentecost, that when the church came together in prayer, and they used it, and they prayed, and if you look at the Acts 2 and 42 through 47, how the church came together, they was in prayer, they was teaching, they was fellowshipping, and they were sharing that material goods. The church was unified back then, and I'm saying we need to stay that way now. We do need to stay that way. Okay. Now, let me show you, let me show you again, and I'm going to get into uh, my text in a minute, the, the verses. The Bible is filled with examples of people who prayed and knew the power of prayer. And I've just mentioned one. Paul was one of those who really believed in prayer because and even though he was uh, uh, establishing churches throughout Asia Minor, Wherever he went, he would always thank God and be for those Christians at that particular city. And uh, he would thank God for them and for himself as well, because he believed in the power of prayer. Let me say this to you. Let me just give you another example about Paul and his firm belief in prayer. When Paul and his companion Silas was in prison facing certain death the next morning. They did not have a pity party. They had a midnight prayer meeting. And God delivered them. So here once again, there's power and prayer. And I know we everybody on this line, or however you listen, can have a testimony of prayer that you have prayed and asked God for, and he delivered. That prayer was answered. Okay. Now, and we do prayers of thanksgiving, adoration, supplication, and intercessory. And I, I won't pull you the scriptures. I'll tell you the scriptures. When Paul looked at prayer from three perspectives, one was doctrinal. And that is included in the lesson we're looking at at verse Ephesians 1, and verses 17 through 19. Then he looked at it from a the theological perspective, and that's in Ephesians chapter 3, and verses 14 through 19. And that is having the right spirit and the love of Christ, because you know Christ himself when he was on earth, he prayed 
And sometimes he needed to just go and talk to his father by himself. And he would just uh, to break away from his disciples and go into prayer. Okay. Now, then the practice of prayer is outlined in Ephesians, the sixth chapter we see, Ephesians, in verses 18 through 20, when it talks about that we should always pray and make intercessory and supplication of prayers. Okay, now this brings me to my first outline. <laughs> this brings me to my first outline. Okay, <laughs> and if you ever know anything about me, you know I'm a firm believer in prayer. You know, and I, I try to set the lesson up to give you some background about this and that, so it'll be meaningful to us. Okay, now it starts in verse fifteen. Uh, 15, 16, it talks about Paul's prayer of thanksgiving. Remember, I just I said there was four kinds of prayer and thanksgiving. Paul is expressing his gratitude to the Ephesian church and God from him hearing that the Ephesian church had heard and believed the truth of God's word. Now, Yes, the truth is going to stand and it's going to win. So and we have false teachers today just as we did doing in Paul's day. And he was thankful that, and I noticed the key words here, that the Ephesian church had heard and believed the truth. That's the key word, the truth of God's word. Because uh, let me say that when we study in our study and our study of the book of Acts during our Bible study time, we found that when Paul was uh, establishing churches and he was bringing the truth of God, then there was false teachers that was coming behind him and uh, swaying some of them's mind so they would believe all this false doctrine. Mm -hmm. And one, one time that really had Paul upset. So my what I'm trying to make here. It is important to believe the truth. And how do we believe the truth? We have to know the truth. And I, you've always heard me, we have to read and study the scriptures for ourselves. Because you have those smooth talking, false, uh, fast walking, and 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 half truth doctrinal teaching will persuade and leave us astray, uh, lead us astray every time. So it is very important for us to study the scriptures for ourselves and, and always ask God, the Holy Spirit, to reveal to you what is meant by the scripture. Second Timothy 2 and 15 tells us, study the soul that I self approve. That means you will know the truth of God's word for yourself. Okay, all right. Let me say this. In Paul's prayer, he was always constantly include his fellow believers in his prayers of thanksgiving. And, and so, and that's indicative or as strongly encouraged for us today. Don't be selfish in our prayers. We all need prayer. I need prayer. I'm praying for some uh, uh, in my prayer time. I don't just include prayer for me because when we look at society today, mm. <laughs> it is in one mess. It, it really is in a mess. So we should pray for our fellow believers and non-believers as well. And when we're praying for non-believers, that God will touch their heart and hear, adhere, adhere to the, His Word and and be and believe in Jesus Christ, because that's part of our mission. That mm -hmm. takes in eight Acts one uh, one and eight. When we are to, we have been empowered with the power of the Holy Spirit to boldly witness Christ. And we, we can't know about, we have to know him, not just about him, to be effective in our witness. And we know him through our personal testimonies 
Because listen, you can't testify to something you don't know about. <laughs> you certainly cannot. So uh, we are living testimonies. If it's no more than the fact that God saved us from eternal damnation. That's a testimony. And then if you pass one, you have a testimony because you've been through some things. And our trials test our faith and grow us deeper in God's love and the knowledge of him and his power to deliver. And see now, that's, it means that when it says God hears and he answers prayer, because he does. And, and see, and I have given some of my personal testimony that when I've come through some things and I believed in my prayers that I went and asked God for. And you may have heard me say this. If you're going to pray, don't worry. Because he's telling me you don't like, you have don't have faith in what you ask God for. And ask him to give us the patience to continue to have faith in him until he delivers. He may not deliver overnight. It might take him a minute because his time is not our time. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But his time is very timely. He, it's that, that phrase is, he's an on-time God. He is. And it's his time to move, he moves. So we just have to wait. Okay, now let me go this. And we talked about Ephesians 6 and 18, where it talks about praying always with all prayer and supplication and the spirit and watching there to forth with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. They're talking about when Paul was making his prayer, he would always include other believers in his prayers. And I said, yes, that is good. I do too, and I'm sure other who are prayers and believers, when they don't just pray for self, they pray for our other believers because we all need prayer. If it's no more than um, to thank God for waking us up the next morning and giving us activities or either for whatever, we all need prayer. It's not, it's, there's no way around it. And I don't know how to explain it other than don't be selfish in our, in our prayers. Because it's just as we are praying for somebody, of self and others, somebody else is praying for us. So it's, it's, and it's a, um, a beautiful cycle when we, we're saints are praying for one another. That's my whole point. Okay. Um, then we are to petition God in our steadfast faith, knowing that he's going to believe in, that he will, he know he is. Now, God don't wear a hearing aid. And he is, and just as I just said, he will move and answer our prayers in his time, okay? And we must uh, stay faithful in our prayers, and that is persevering. We don't stop praying, and we don't waver in our faith. We just know we have, God is going to do what we ask him to do. But we love him, and he loves us. Okay? Now, the second, let me get to the second part of our outline here. It's this intercessory prayer. And in most of our Sunday school lessons, we have intercessory prayer. And this is where Paul is talking about that other section of the kind of prayer that I mentioned. And he was making intercessory uh, prayer. And I'll read verses, the first two verses, 17 and 18. And he reads this, that the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I'll get to that. Let me just keep reading. And verse 18 says, The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of inheritance in the saints. And that says a lot. First of all, let me say here in verse 17, 
Paul was praying to God that he, God, would give the Ephesian church the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Who is the, the wisdom here? Because our lesson subject is Christ is wisdom. And Christ, wisdom of God, Christ is God. Now, I don't think I'm talking about two different people. Is because when he, when you get his wisdom and knowledge of him and accept him as your personal savior, there is a blessing beyond the our imagination. Okay. Now, and once we get that knowledge, because wisdom is the wise use of knowledge that is revealed to all by God. And once we accept Christ for who he is, he's God's son, our savior who went to the cross and died for our sin. That's who he is, okay? Mm -hmm. And part of our prayer, we should be thankful that God, the whole God, the Holy Spirit convicted our hearts that we would adhere to the truth of God's word of saying that we you need did. a savior. Jesus Christ is that savior. And oh, that's okay. We have, and we'll open our spiritual eyes would have been open. Okay. Okay. And we'll have an uh um a godly enlightenment and understanding that will uh, enable all believers, all of us, to draw closer to God, enabling us to obey him. And his purpose for us. And I, I kind of alluded to that purpose earlier. That we are to witness to the world. By the truth of our salvation. And that is our faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. Now when we can witness that. To that truth. Means we have. Our spiritual eyes. Has been come open. We have the knowledge. The enlightenment of who Christ is. We accept him for who he is. And he is just as powerful as God the Father. You know that, and, and you know, and then I start saying, and you know, he was with God, present with God, doing creation. Okay. Now, and I was getting into God called us for a purpose. And our purpose is to witness, to, as I just was saying, and I'm going to lead into that we as believers are the salt of the earth. And the salt is we are seasoning the earth with, with is the truth of God's word. Okay? And we being, as ambassadors, we are seasoning the earth, the world, with his truth. That's our witness. And the light of the world, we as believers, because we are in Christ and we are manifesting the righteousness of Christ. And we do that through our very lifestyle. Because we, when we do, we are manifesting the fruits of the Spirit. What are they? Their joy, their peace, their love, and their uh, meekness. They're found in, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Okay. All right. All right, so we do that because the world is looking at us and how we conduct our life. And, and when we can live in this world, knowing that our heavenly home is not in this world, and knowing who we are, we are the righteous of Christ, and we have, have a mission, and that is to make other disciples or other bring others into the full knowledge of God through our witness, okay? Through our witness. And in our, when our lifestyle coincides with what we are saying, that's a powerful witness. And you're making a powerful impact in the world, okay? Now, if I could say this, the world... Is filled with sin. We see it every day. And it didn't just get this way either. But our things is happening in the world that during my younger days when I was a kid, I never would have thought it would have been this bad. And even in our political system, yeah, we've always had two 
parties, the Democrats and Republicans. And I never, ever would have thought I would have seen and witnessed so much hate and vitriol coming out of one party as I do today. And I mean, I just, I just, I never thought that. I never did. But we who are Christians have to stand firm on the truth of our faith, even though they're spewing hate and seeking to harm innocent people, and we are included. We pray for them and ask God to touch them hearts. I'm telling you. Because uh, we are not to hate. We are to love our fellow man, as I said. But you said, well, how is that? So? Well, you have to ask God to hate you, to help you love them anyway. You don't hate the person. You hate the sin that they're doing. And all of this hate and, and, and this uh, verbal personal attacks on that fellow man is truly not of God. And if they tell you that they are a Christian and carrying on this kind of stuff, what was that scripture verse last week? That they said they're lying because you cannot love and hate at the same time. You cannot say you love God and you never see him with your physical eye. And if you got that much hate in you, you don't have your spiritual classic eyes on anyway. to be that hateful to, to your fellow man. Some, <laughs> and some of it is simply because we look different or we think different or you have a different ph uh, philosophy or ideology. Hate just is not of God. Okay, all right? So what am I trying to say to you is this. We are to pray for our fellow man. Okay? The evil one, ask God to change their hearts. Remove that as scripture, and I can't quote the exact scripture. When it said, God, remove that, I think it's in Jeremiah. Remove that stony heart and replace it with a, a soft heart, one of love, one of compassion, one of care. Okay? And that stony heart is equated to the evilness and hatred that is being spewed and was back in Paul's day. And what we are living through was talked about in the Bible. So now let me go. I want to make this. If we can continue in our spirit, God's spirit, we will be able to see and do things according to God. And love, our fellow man, is one of them. And let me say this, point out something to some of us, uh, some of us who may think they've been holy all their life. You know, tell me that because I know better because you wouldn't. <laughs> we all had to come and believe in Jesus Christ for ourselves, okay? Now, as we grow in our spiritual walk through a Bible study and meditation and obeying what God says, we will grow stronger in our understanding of him and who he is. And our lives will become more enriched and we'll be able to enrich the lives around some of the people around us because we will be uh, manifesting the fruits of the spirit that I just mentioned, love and all those. Okay, now I see, I don't looked around here. Time's getting away from me. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> Encouraging the church at Ephesus to open their spiritual eyes so they could see and manifest God's power. And I'll t I want them to say this uh, to the churches today. And I'm not making any negative accusation. I'm just saying, make sure that we, as the church, keep our spiritual eyes open because there's power in prayer. And when we come together and pray, God moves. And we can look no further than this on the day of Pentecost. Okay. Now. And I, I 
I know I've alluded to this earlier, that our mission, he called us and set us aside to be the salt and light of the world. Keep carrying the truth of his word to all unbelievers because it's his God's perfect desire that all be saved and live in holy union with him. But him being all knowing and God, who is all knowing and all wise, knew from the beginning of time, as he still knows, so many is going to reject him and be lost. But that doesn't negate his desire, his perfect will for us. He want all of because humanity was the only creation that was that he created in his image and likeness. So why would he not have that design for all of his 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 humanity to be in perfect harmony with him? That's that harmonious relationship. But him still, I'll say this again, him being all known knew that many was not gonna do that. And we see that today. Many is spewing all this hate. They're not, can't be of God. Okay. Let me just move on to the <laughs> another last part because this, this, tell, this clock tells me I got a minute here. And where Paul, nine, verses 19 through 23, talks about an accessory. It's where he turned from making an accessory prayer to prayers of praises and the power that God that there is in and prayer. Okay, let me kind of sum it up this way. He talks about the power, the greatest power that we have as believers is our prayers. Okay, when we can recognize and acknowledge God for who He is and His power, we are, should praise Him. We should praise him because what he has done and is doing for us. Okay, let me say this. Praising God is he due to us. Prayer is a form of worship. And that's why when we go into prayer, it should be just as sincere and honest because it is a form of worship. We are either thanking and praising God for who he is, or we are petitioning him for something, or we are making an intercessory prayer on the behalf of someone else. That's power in prayer. Okay. Listen. Let me say this. And I know we already know this. God is the only one who created all that he created all that exists and he sustains all of his creation. And so all who believe in Jesus Christ is new creation. That's what that means. Because we are set aside. And we talked about this, that God, the power of Jesus' blood and all it done for us in a sermon a couple of Sundays ago. So um, we must praise him and thank him for his goodness. Just thank him if he don't do nothing but thank him for being created in his image. He put his part of himself into us. So why yeah. not just thank him for that? If you can't do find nothing else to thank him for, come on, come on. <laughs> come on now. <laughs> Knowing that you're praying to the sovereign God of the universe, all of these other little GODs cannot heal you. He cannot give you salvation. And he certainly can't answer your call. So, I I mean, <laughs> I would just, I, I do. And, I, and I'm going to encourage him, just thank him for who he is. So let me just close out with this. I know we're getting out of, out of time here. But these points, prayer should be our practical practice for every believer. We should have a daily prayer life. But we commune with God. It is our most effective spiritual weapon when we use it and sincere and honesty. Listen, I, I, I adopted this phrase from Dr. Stanley. I stand tall from my knees because prayer is powerful. 
And I used to hear my other late prayer partner, Sister Bebo, said, if prayer can't do it, it can't be done. <laughs> and she said, prayer is the keys to the king and faith unlocks the door. And it goes hand in hand because when you pray, you're doing it in honesty. And when you're having faith in your prayer, it really something else because you're saying, God, I trust you with what I prayed to you for. And I trust you for I'm praying and thanking you for what you've already done. Okay. And when we are making intercessory prayer, it's showing our love to somebody else. Listen, I said this and I'm through. A praying church is the international working of God. Now let that soak in for me. A praying church is the international workings of God. One is because there's power in prayer. Two, that we are praying to the almighty sovereign God. Okay? And who is the church? The church is the body of Christ. And he is the head of it. Then therefore, and as I said, we said it was already established that prayer is a form of worship. And when we can go and pray honestly, honesty and faithful in prayer, things begin to happen. And let me close with this. Christ being God, his power transcends all other powers because he is God. And my closing question, have you prayed today? Yes, Father God, we thank you for this lesson. Hopefully it resonated with somebody and that if they don't have a prayer life, they will incorporate a fervent prayer life into their life. Father, we just thank you for being God all by yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Oh, I forgot to ask if there's any questions or comments. <laughs> Wonderful service. Well, I tried. I tried. Have a good day. We'll talk later this afternoon. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. So let me close this out and so we can get ready for...